We're rolling. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just get down to it, really. Um, like I said, it's just to kind of to cut into some of the great footage that you've got already. We'll just cut to the shot of you looking into the camera and just telling us a little bit about yourself and what you kind of, I suppose, what your view of the world is and view of, of, of the vet stuff that you do and the animals and your patients and um, customers and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so could you just tell me about your um, your clinic at the moment? What's it called and, and where is it and what, what job do you have there? Right now, I'm presently at Associate Veterinary Hospital, um, a partner there. Uh, I've, I've been a great place to work for the last 18 years. I, my, my, my plan was always to be the doctor's doctor, um, to be that guy that somebody calls and they have advice on some strange species or some strange procedure. And although I think I've done well there, I would like to take that next step in my career. So as of the next month or so, I'm probably going to go and, and, uh, and change my shingle to another place. Um, but anyway, so right now I'm presently at Social Veterinary Hospital, and within a month or two, I think I'll be working at another hospital called Happy Tales. Uh, Happy Tales is a little bit more wildlife friendly, a little bit more exotic friendly. I mean, it's not that my present hospital doesn't bend over backwards for lizards and snails and snakes, but at the same time, they, they promise to be a little bit more friendlier about the work that we do. So anyway, with that in mind, I, uh, you know, I, I'm now presently at Social Veterinary Hospital, but I will soon be taking up a different shingle. Okay, great. That's really good. Um, okay, so tell us about your, um, in terms of your veterinary work, what's your, uh, do you have a favourite um, aspect of it, a favourite kind of things that you like to focus on or specialise in? Um, in the States, it's kind of strange to use the word specialise unless you actually have that board certification in that area. Um, I would say my special interest is in exotics. Um, I was published for doing, um, for doing some turtle uh, skull repair uh, back in 93, so some people would say that turtles would be my forte, but I, I like them all evenly, you know, as far as, uh, as, far as where, what I like the most, I would, uh, I would say all of the species, because if at some point in time, every one of these species is going to offer me a chance to do something I've never done before, and hopefully we'll be good at it the next time around as well. So what's, um, can you give me, say, in the past month, um, what kind of range of animals and species have you helped um, look after and cure or, or whatever? Um, let me see. In the last month, I've seen a species that I've never seen as a doctor before. I've to see two Gila monsters. Um, and I've done rabbits, uh uh, well, I'm trying to think of something I haven't. I haven't done any lions, tigers, and bears in the last month or so. But I mean, a ferret. I uh, I have a ferret case right now that's probably going to be surgerized tomorrow, and I'm going to have to differentiate between a prepucial mass and an actual penis mass. Um, you know, a tumor of the penis, and uh, and hopefully I can save this creature's life and be able to you know have this guy peeing normally. But right now it's peeing through a large tumor. Um, and I'd like to, you know, just give you one of the stranger things that I've got to look for in the next week. Um, other than that, uh, I can think of a few lizards that possibly have some possible foreign bodies I might have to do some work with. Uh, I've got snakes right now suffering from pneumonia and stomatitis. Uh, a rabbit with a bladder stone. Uh, wow, I'm trying to, I mean, I, I, no lions, tigers, and bears. Other than that, I could name almost everything else plus two yellow monsters. One of two of the world's uh, poisonous lizards. Huh. So, is there anything? So, you say poisonous lizards. Is there anything that um, that is say too dangerous for you uh, to work on in terms of? <laughs> well, yeah, as, as, as somebody who's a, a novice or doesn't, you know, ignorant, you could say. Is there anything? I mean, could you deal with a bear, or is that too dangerous a, for your practice? A, or you mean a a, a bat? Yeah. Oh, um, I, I work with bats all the time. Uh, they send me wildlife. They're quite frail. By the time I get to see them, uh, they're quite emaciated or their wings are broken away that I can't fix them. I, I made a joke the other day to one of the biologists, the bat biologists, that I probably have more bats in formalin than, you know, than he has in his, uh, in his whole collection. Um, anyway, so I try to save them for future reference. Um, but uh, let me see. 
as far as one of the most dangerous creatures, I'm certified for hot snakes and poisonous snakes. Um, I'm certified, again, obviously, for heal monsters and a few poisonous lizards. Uh, I often say that I, I, the one creature I don't like to work with is, uh, is porcine or pigs because I just can't be trusted with bacon. Just can't be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, how do you, um, where do you, where do you get your, um, the animals and different species from? Who brings them to you? Uh, private owners. Um, the owner of the Gila Monster is actually a police officer in a, a local neighboring city here. Um, I get them coming from as far east as Florida, as far west as Baton Rouge in the vet school, um, as far north as Georgia. There's actually a client that brings down their, uh, their rabbit every once in a while when it needs some work from Georgia. Uh, because I do exotics, I, I get them from everywhere. I mean, as far as where they come from, wildlife, clients. Uh, and then just those haphazard patients that just come my way because somebody needed someone to work on them. I actually have uh, adopted a pet monkey named Daisy, and, uh, and she was one of those cases that was having a bad family life and actually needed some medical treatment at the same time. I love my Daisy. She's awesome. So you, so you have a, a, a pet monkey that you, I mean, you, do you kind of carry her around? What's the, where, where does she live and does she go to your... She, she actually lives in a cage. Uh, she's a small monkey. She's a uh, red arm tamarind. When she stands, she stands about that tall and she's got a tail about that long. Um, she's just a beautiful black creature with red arms and feet. Uh, I'm glad I'm nearsighted because that means when she's close, I can actually see what she's thinking and, and, and trying to tell me. But uh, yeah, she, you know, and I do primates as well. So uh, it's just one of, of all the monkeys, I mean, all the people I've tried to talk out of having a monkey... Uh, now that I actually own one, I can see why it's it's a great way to or a great pet to have. But I will tell you, because of her size, because of her species, and there's a lot of animosity toward other primates amongst our primate civilization, that uh, they're probably still not the best pet to have. But I occasionally will put her on my shoulder and walk around. And I, to be totally honest, I actually have a purple stroller, and I take her for walks in the neighborhood in a purple stroller. It's not the most manly thing I've ever done, but it, I do that for her. <laughs> And so do you, so tell me about, um, obviously, if you're carrying a monkey around in a purple stroller, you love animals. When did you first start to realize that you loved animals? Did you have them as kids? And, and when did you kind of feel that calling to become a vet? Um, when I was, I think I had been trained since I was a child to become a vet. This is going to sound strange. When I was a kid, I had every animal encyclopedia, the Grismix, uh, um, I had all these little animal encyclopedias and, and, and things as a kid. Uh, one of my first memorable uh, toys that I'd ever gotten or gifts during Christmas outside of an army bike that had training wheels on it was a, a dissecting kit. And with this dissecting kit, I got these you know jars of uh, creatures in form line from a, a Jerusalem cricket to an earthworm that was a foot long, this cute little you know octopus that I probably spent hours walking, you know, looking at to check him out. Anyway... Uh, they gave me a dissecting kit, and they gave me the specimens with which to dissect. And for some strange reason, I didn't want to harm my specimens, so I was, like, dissecting anything dead in the neighborhood. So I learned a lot about slugs very young. <laughs> I'm sorry if there's any slug enthusiasts out there. I did learn a lot, and I'm actually able to fix a lot, but I did sacrifice a few in the process. Um, but anyway, because I was born into a musical family, I, somewhere along the line, I guess I was convinced that I couldn't be a doctor. I was, you know, convinced that I was going to be a rock and roller and a vocalist for rock bands, and and that's it, as as much as I was trying to work on animals, I just was doing my music career, and uh, somewhere along the line, uh, a very, you know, close uh, girlfriend and one of our, our groupies at that point in time basically had said, you know, when I was helping her study, if I don't go back to school, I'd never get laid again, um, so I did, and I did, and uh, and now I'm a doctor, so it's awesome. So I've been trained tra trained to do this since I can remember. I just wasn't smart enough to know it. And what's the um, what's the best thing for you uh, about about your job? The best thing, the best thing, um, making people and animals happy. I, you know, it's making something from nothing. You know, this is an entropic universe. I mean, everywhere you look, things are falling apart. You know, uh, fighting off the the man in black with the sickle. You know, if I can slow his progress and slow his roll a little bit, then it makes my life a little bit easier. 
and I managed to make a meager living in the process. So I, the best thing, I'd say making something from nothing. And then there are those moments where I get to be like Captain Kirk and to go someplace where no man's gone before and, you know, and do something really cool like that. So that's why I keep my nose to the grindstone. And what's, um, tell me about your, um, your fire engine and, and that project that you've got going <laughs> on at the moment. All right. This actually starts several years ago. Um, we had Hurricane George coming through uh, many years ago. I can't even remember what year it was. And when uh, Hurricane George came through, I, we were stuck at the hospital. And there was, it's probably the only time in history that the humans actually smelled worse than the animals in my hospital. And there was like 20 something people there and over 100 animals that were being boarded there. And my new home at the time and girlfriend at the time actually didn't, didn't want to stay at the house and trusted the hospital more. So we stayed there. By the time the storm was over with, I was getting these phone calls that there was a pygmy sperm whale that was beached just two cities over on the coast. And, and I, those are the cases, you know, back to the Captain Kirk of veterinary medicine, those are the cases that, that really throw my quill. So I was trying to get there and as best I could, and all I had was a black kit car, you know, with a 302 racing motor in it. And there were trees all over the roads, and the roads were non-drivable unless you had a four-wheel drive. So they called me, they wanted me to get there, but Fish and Wildlife Service and, uh, and some other locals there, and I couldn't make it. So they were even, there was even talk of helicoptering me to the, you know, to the whale, but it just didn't happen. So what we learned, okay, was that uh, not every doctor is, is ambitious enough to want to try and fix those cases. It turned out that a local doctor there ended up putting that creature down, um, you know, and, and that in itself was a whole different story. But they ended up cutting it in half and taking it away in two pickup trucks. So the lesson was basically this simple. One, I needed to be able to get to those places in a hurry when the time came, which means I needed a really big heavy duty vehicle. And I also needed something that would be able to carry a whale. Um, you know, a pygmy sperm whale specifically, you know, twice as long as a dolphin, you know, something that can easily be 14, 15 foot long or longer. So I told myself when the time came, if I ever had that opportunity, I was gonna buy that truck or make one well, my wife made me sell my F-350. I had a dually, long bed, uh, cab. It had all the bells and whistles. And because it was green and it had two holes in the fender, she didn't like it, so she made me sell it. And I told her one day that was going to be a curse she wished she hadn't done. So uh, while her back was turned, I saw that one of our local fire engines was for sale. And this truck is 25 feet long and 12-foot 12, 12 bed in the back of it. So uh, I bought it. I, uh, I, I haggled with them for about you know, five minutes and got it for like about 500 bucks and bought it from underneath her. And I told her by taking a video and running around her telling her about her new truck that was going to be in the driveway. And since then, I've changed it from red to white with a tan racing stripe. And except for some getting some uh, um, vacuum lines to the motor and the, the, uh, the brake lines, it's, it's almost road ready. That's one sturdy vehicle. I cannot wait to put that on the road and have pictures driving it. So, so you have so you have this big vehicle. It's going to be able to um, kind of go through lots of different types of terrain. Mm -hmm. In terms of your, um, where do you expect? What kind of callouts do you think that you might have well, uh, use for it? I suppose. As far as its uses go, uh, I would. Uh, how would I put this? It's think of it. Think of it as just a humongous pickup truck. Okay, that could carry two or three dolphins if it needed to. Um, you know, it would also be able to carry 50 or 60 dogs or, you know, or, or the same number of cats or if there was ever a need to get animals out of an area or into an area in a hurry, that vehicle would do it. Now, it probably wouldn't do it more than any faster than 55 or 60 miles an hour, you know, but it would be able to go over, you know, roll over other smaller vehicles and, and roll over beams and, you know, telephone poles and things like that. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an F-850, it's a Ford. Um, it's got the original motor in it. It only had 28,000 original miles. Um, it, you know, so it, it, it's going to be a gas guzzler. It's one of the biggest gas motors they make. And uh, so anyway, it'll be fine. It, it, my point is, you know, it'll be able to take animals or equipment or anything anywhere. It's even built to where there is a, uh, a, an electric generator in one of the back boxes. There's an air compressor in another back box. So if I needed to go somewhere and there was a, a structure that needed to be built for animals, say, you know, a, a, a large building, in a hurry, that you could park it there, plug it in, and you could build it from that truck alone. 
No, so do you, would you say in terms of um, vets in your area with your ambition and your belief, do you think you, would you say that you are a unique kind of character when it comes to being a vet? Um, or would other people say about you? I mean, without kind of... I have a nickname in the area. I'm called the Crazy Vet. So in some form or fashion, I guess that would make me kind of unique. And what do you... Um, what do you think is most important um, that you have uh, when, you, when you're dealing with, let's say, an owner and their pet? What kind of... Do you have any attributes that you think really helps one, calm down the owner, and, and then secondly, save the pet or, you know, help the pet? Um, I, I think my personality and my ability to, to communicate with a client is probably a little bit better than others. I, uh, I, I once worked for a doctor whose, uh, whose motto was to command respect, okay? Um, he wanted you to walk in with a coat on, a suit, and a tie. Uh, and he was, you know, whenever some, if he didn't get the right answer from a client, he would get mad, and, and he didn't feel like he was getting the right answers to save this patient's life, and he, he thought, his motto was to command respect, okay, you walk in, you command it. I, uh, I've learned over the years that I think earning it has been one of those things that, that makes it a little bit easier for me, so as you can tell, I would wear some crazier scrubs, when they walk in and they see this doctor, I think that their expectations are a little on the blown side. They're a little more likely to want to talk to me as far as that goes. And, and I, my wife would say I have a unique ability of thinking outside of the box 24 hours a day. So I think those two things probably would, would give, may give a patient or a client a different answer or a different outlook than they get from another veterinarian. And what, and what do you think um, in terms of a message that you try and get out to um, the owners or, you know, if we were to do this TV show, what kind of, is there a message that you want people to to take about how they look after animals or how we as humans kind of look after animals and wildlife and different species? Actually, there are several messages. Uh, they may just ramble off the tip of my tongue at this point in time, but one, compassion is pretty much the right of all creatures. It's the right of all species. Um, and we're all related. I mean, every one of us is related. I, uh, I'm, I'm a big sci-fi fan, and when I hear about space, you know, space travel, you know, I kind of giggle under my breath because we're, we're not just humans, okay? There are more bacteria in us than there are cells that make us. Um, so, in theory, space travel would not be possible for our species unless we were able to take these creatures that make that are symbiotic within us out to space and make them as healthy as well. You know, so I, I, I think that we as a species, homo sapiens, tend to separate ourselves from the rest of the world and that's probably one of the biggest mistakes and the biggest fallacies I've ever seen in society. You know, when these small creatures and songbirds and these other things, you know, they, they start getting sick or ill, you know, someone will go, oh, that's sad. You know, but I'm seeing a link in a chain that's keeping us alive with her, and that, that's a problem for me. So that's why I try to do this multi-species approach, and, and I have no prejudice when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, if you hear the twistling in the background, it's the monkey screaming at me. Um, anyway, so uh, I, that, that'd be my biggest message. I would like everyone to know at least that much. We are not alone here in any way, shape, or form, and the, the fate of their fate is our fate. So is that why you perhaps like to specialize in exotic animals or animals that some people see as different? Uh, there, I'm, I'm trying to wait, turn on to, to put that back into a question and then tell you the answer. Um, I like exotic animals, and, and I think I found the niche in exotic animals because you know there aren't a lot of doctors that want to work on them. You know, it does require thinking completely outside the box. You, you can't be, you know, doing dog and cat medicine your whole life, you know, and wanting to, you know, to protect, you know, protect these creatures from, from certain diseases that may be normal for wildlife. Uh, there's a species of, of a parasite called cytozoonosis that's normal in bobcats, but will kill the average domestic cat. You know, most veterinarians look at cytozoonosis as a bad thing, but yet cytozoonosis is part of that biome, that normal biome for bobcats. 
You know, so you, you have to think in a wider range. You've got to be able to look at that species and say, this is what's normal for this one. And, you know, and you got to put in that study time. You know, you know so I like exotics for that reason. It's always something to learn, always something new to, to figure out. You know, and it goes back to that going where no man has gone before, you know, theory or motto. So, um, in terms of the wildlife, do you, um, I think I saw a video of you putting a, a turtle back into the water. Do you, if someone brings you uh, some wildlife that's, that's been injured perhaps or found, do you, what happens are you, just talk me through the process, you will operate or, or treat or whatever and then do you look after the rehab and then put them back into the wild or does it, how does that work? Um, well, I, I'm part of the rehabbing process. I will tell you I'm lucky being a doctor and, and doing the exotics and the fact that I can, you know, somebody will bring me a turtle that's been hit by a car, you know, they'll bring it over to the office, I'll get some basic information from them, where it came from, who they are, just in case, the, you know, there needs to be some kind of a case or, you know, or, or a legal report done. And then, you know, what will happen is at that point in time, uh, I'll fix it. You know, triage it, do as best I can to save its life. If it's, you know, something that might not be salvageable, I'll make sure I give it a nice peaceful end to its life, you know, and pain-free. If it's something that we can work on, yes, I'll set it in line and do the surgery or whatever treatment that it takes. And then from there, I would probably hand it over to one of the rehabbers and kind of oversee it as a doctor. I mean, rehabbing is a lot of tender loving care for a lot of creatures. You know, and it's it's nice to be able to diagnose these things, but I would never sleep if I had to do the rehabbing business as well. So it, it, I turn usually turn them back over. So say for example, a turtle's been hit by a car. You know, it comes in with a cracked shell or you know a crushed head. You know, I'm the person to put all that back together again once it's stable and I have a treatment for it. Then I will turn it over to the rehab people. Um, there are several in the area. Um, and, uh, and one of my favorites is Wild at Heart. They, they've been friendly and to everybody, including the other rehab units. And, uh, and then, you know, again, turn it over to them. They would take care of it. At some point in time, I would ask, can I be there for the release? Can I not be there for the release? You know, depending on how busy I am and what I want to get on video. And, uh, and they would just take it one step at a time. Great. And um, in terms of, you mentioned surgery there, what kind of types of, um, I suppose, how deep, what's the most like, um, the longest or the most complex types of surgery you do compared to say something that's small I mean how, how big do you do you put them under anesthetic and work for hours or is it always a bit quicker um well I, I hope it's not working for hours but there have been those cases uh, we had a bald eagle a few years ago that was uh, shot it turned his his whole life story was quite simple actually at some point in time he had a broken leg and a broken wing and couldn't fly this bald eagle had then been running and bouncing around eating roadkill for any number of months Somebody had seen it, thought it was a vulture, and although it's illegal to shoot vultures, they shot it anyway. And the bullet had gone in here, through here, and out to the elbow. Um, that bird took hours of stabilization. It, it went through surgery several times for several hours. We ended up saving the bird's life. You know, the whole time it's, it's uh, you know, since it came to us with metabolic bone disease, it, you know, it was hard to correct that indoors, but you can't put the animal outside. Um, you know, anyway, so this bird had gone through hours of procedure. It had stainless steel in and out of its legs, you know, and I was one surgery away from setting this creature free. I was going to do a bone graft and replace a part of its carpus um, and hopefully get it off to Dollywood where they've got this humongous flight cage um, and let this over 30-year-old bird, you know, go back to, to some semblance of nature and get some free food for a while. I mean, this bird was banded as an adult when I got out of high school. You know, so it's it was ancient. I mean, this bird was out there for a long, long time. And it turns out that the people, the rehabbers I turned it over to, kind of had different ideas. I never saw the bird back. It ended up going to an Alabama rehab place, and rehab facility, where they ended up amputating that arm. I mean, all the hours I spent saving it, another doctor went and yanked it off. And then the bird died or was put to sleep months later. You know, so here, you know, I had these grand plans where I spent hours in surgery to fix this one bird, and it turns out that somebody else just wanted to thwart all those hours of time. All that effort. Still a sore spot in my side. Yeah, so do you, so do you, um, I mean, how personally do you take some of the cases, and, and do you have a kind of method of, 
uh, kind of distancing yourself so you can carry on and get the job done and then also go home and enjoy yourself at night rather than, you know, stay up all night worrying or, you know. Well, I don't, you can't distance yourself. I, I don't, I mean, there, when it comes to euthanasias or, or, you know, doing that, that final act of compassion when some animal is on its way out, you know, helping them, helping them across that line, it, there's, there's really, there's no way to really distance yourself. It's still, to this day, one of my, my least favorite things. Um, and it's, it's those personal relationships that I get with them that make my nights better. You know, how many people can say that they've looked a bald eagle in the eye and came to this understanding, you know, after a few days of intensive care and him realizing that I wasn't there to eat him and I was going to hand him free food, to watch that realization go from I'm completely scared of you you know, to wow, you know, you're. I look forward to you showing up every morning and you know, and taking care of me. There's there. That's what keeps me going at night. These are these are species that have never seen compassion or human compassion, and uh, or any kind of compassion. I mean, their whole life was you know, bird eat fish, bird eat other animal, you know, and try to hide from those things that might eat it. And then it gets to see a whole different side. It gets to see compassion. And that's something that most wildlife just don't see. You know, and to watch them realize that from that moment of being <gasps> scared to, you know, oh, wow, give me a fish. This is cool. We have a, we have a relationship here. That's nice. I like that. Um, and what's the, what's the, what's the um, so when you do, when you save animals, what's, how does that feel when you can go and tell a, a child or, uh, I know, you know, the owner who's had it for years or, or even somebody who saved it from the wildlife. Well, how does that feel when you go in and you say it's successful and and that, you know things are positive? Wow. Um, um, I mean, I, I, there there really is no better feeling as to how to put that in words. I I would have to cuss and say some real explicatives and stuff, and you know I don't want to do that on camera. Um, it, it's it's just awesome. I, I mean, it really is. Again, you know, the, the back to that bald eagle. You know, or cases like that bald eagle, you know, to, to watch them go from completely being afraid of you to, you know, wow, let's be friends and let's come to a, you know, come to a friendly conclusion together is, is just an awesome thing. Um, and then to, to, to share that, I mean, you know, go back to where you may be with a client, to have that same feeling with a client. I, uh, uh, for, for example, here's a case for us. Um, we had this one dog that come to us a while back. Uh, the dog was afraid of everyone. They brought the dog in because it, its eye was looking kind of funny, and this dog hid under furniture and had been like this for years. It had previously had a fungal infection that can be quite systemic and neurologic in nature. And while they're telling me about this dog's history, I'm like, really? So this dog is, you know, really head shy? Oh yeah, it won't come out. At night it comes out and it runs around the house and plays, but in the daytime it hides, you know, because it's afraid of the light. And afraid of people that come in the house. So with a little bit of a physical exam, I was able to figure out that this bird, I mean, sorry, this dog, sorry, wasn't, you know, wasn't afraid of the light. The light hurt it. It actually had a, a, a mild form of glaucoma, and every time its eye would contract from the light, it would cause intense pain in this dog. So by recognizing a, a simple, you know, ophthalmic disease, I was able to put it on some treatment, and now this dog runs around in the daylight, wags his tail, is friendly to everybody. You know, and to watch the realization from this client thinking her dog was retarded and, a, you know, part vampire to, to actually just getting some eye drops two or three times a day. And now this dog is a family member again was just awesome. I mean, it's one to see that look in the dog's eyes like, wow, what'd you do? And another thing to watch the client go, holy crap, how long have I been not getting this diagnosis? How long has this not been happening, you know, for my, my, my favorite creature and my family? You know, so it was awesome. That's one of those cool cases. Cool. Okay. Um, right. I've, I've had your time for quite a while, oh, so I don't right. want to. I'm off um, till one. <laughs> okay. So um, I suppose just wrapping in terms of the exotic animals. Um, just so, just to go over it again. So, could you kind of run me through, in not just in a list form, but quite quickly, the types of animals that you see on a kind of regular basis? That it seems that people in your area kind of have do you see what i mean so i personally i don't know anybody with a with a lizard or a snake but maybe it's different so <laughs> could you just run through the kind of the animals that you see quite a lot and 
My uh, most common lizards right now would be uh, the uh, bearded dragon. Um, after that, it turns out the desert geckos. Um, after that, iguanas. Uh, when it comes to snakes, ball pythons are probably the most uh, the most pro um, common. Uh, second most common after that would be like your Burmese pythons, um, reticulated pythons. Um, I have a few cobra patients. Um, that uh, they actually come in. Some are venomoid, which means their, their glands have been removed, but they still scare the hell out of me because if there's just a tiny bit of that gland left over and that last surgeon didn't do a good job, it means I could be like paralyzed and, and it just would not be cool. Anyway, all right, back to the question. Um, when it comes to, to mammals, I see a lot of rabbits, uh, dogs, cats, rabbits, um, ferrets, um, birds, uh, macaws, Amazons, cockatiels, parakeets, uh, canaries. Um, when it comes to wildlife, I think I've gone through the gamut when it comes to this. And when, when it comes to wildlife, I see uh, turtles, tortoises, terrapins, um, some snakes. Uh, most of them end up being treated for uh, gardening tool deficiency. Um, <laughs> one of my best friends, actually, just this uh, just yesterday, had a, uh, a rattlesnake under a, a, a large piece of uh, yard equipment. I think it was actually a, a hoe, a big track hoe, and was telling me that for $500 I could save his life if I got there in a hurry. Um, you know, that was his idea of a joke. Obviously, it was killed days earlier, but he was just having some fun with it. Um, anyway, so I've done rattlesnakes. Um, the birds I see, pelicans. Uh, I see a lot of seagulls. Um, wild, you know, other wild birds, songbirds, uh, blue jays. Uh, wow, I mean, it, it just goes on forever. I mean, you could actually open up a book of local wildlife in this area, and hummingbirds. We actually set you know, did a few good hummingbird cases this year. Um, looking around, see if I'm missing something. Do you have? Um, I think I saw uh, an alligator in one of the videos. Is that a common thing around I'm, in terms of wildlife stuff? I probably would see about five or six alligators a year. And what what kind of what kind of um, injuries or illnesses do they have? Usually it's hook removal. Uh, we had one, her name was Gwen, that was brought in. Somebody he had caught it with a fish hook, brought it to shore, and then tried to bludgeon it to death with a brick. Um, so she came to us pretty much in a coma. Uh, we stated her, we sutured up her injuries. She's actually over at one of the rehab centers in the, the alligator places, and they've got a blind alligator, and they have teamed her up with that one. And these two gators are like two peas in a pot at this point in time. Um, so we saved a big gator for that. We took x-rays over to see what was in there and she'd been hooked about five or six other times with other different hooks. Uh, but I was only, you know, only told to get the one out. Um, so hook removal. Uh, we had one in a while back where it had an arrow through its head. Uh, we had to remove the arrow. Uh, that case is probably to this day still doing fine. Um, usually it's some kind of human caused trauma when it comes to okay. alligators. Yeah. Okay. Um Great, I think we've got loads of great stuff here that I can use and uh, is there anything else that you think that you've kind of thought of that you think would be good to say or anything like that? Um, no, nothing else. I mean, I, I you know, I, if you ask questions, I try to answer them as best I can. Uh, I just want people to know that these creatures, you know, be it your pets, be it wildlife, you know, something you're seeing from a thousand miles away, you know, don't separate yourself from them. We are part of their world. I mean, when you, I'm not too sure about your religious beliefs, but you know, there are a lot of people that actually believe in evolution as a scientific principle. And even if this were a 7,000 year process, we are still part of the same planet, part of the same ecosystem, and we can't live without each other. You know, so when we look down on some species and we decide that we're worth more than them, I, I really believe that is a mistake that we make on a regular basis. So I just want people to stop thinking that way. Yeah. Oh, actually, there is one more thing. In terms of, I saw you, there's one video of you singing, and obviously you have that <laughs> rock and roll background. Can you, do you still, um, away from, you know, obviously you're doing the fire engine, and, but away from work, do you still have, do any rock and roll, or? Um, I, my wife tries to hound me constantly about getting back into another rock and roll band. But that would require another three or four hours a night of my time. Um, it would require her getting used to groupies and people who like to hang out at those places when she's not in town. 
So somewhere she'll go, why don't you go back to doing this again? And then I'll remind her of the, you know, the things she's got to tolerate. And she's like, well, no. Um, the good news is, is I can hang out and close a karaoke bar with no problem. Uh, I am now in a point in my life where I sleep well. I don't have to write songs about how to change the world. I can actually put my hands on it and change it. And, and as far as putting up with other musicians and musicians' girlfriends and their family and their drug habits and everything else, my life is really good right now, okay? I still have my musical talent. Um, I've got friends that want me to do some recording for them, so I occasionally go in and we'll put in a few tracks for them. And I have other friends that would like me to actually do some, uh, some lead tracks on the music. So I still try. Um, I still sing. But uh, it's just a matter of, uh, of finding the time and the, the songs that I, I want to do. So I still play. And karaoke is awesome. And karaoke was one of the best inventions of all time. It takes a musician who got tired of being a musician and puts them in front of a camera or a, you know, a stage or people just long enough to where they can get that itch out of their system. So karaoke is awesome. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, I think that's such great. Uh, one thing I'll tell you is um, just thinking, you, you mentioned that you might be moving to a different um, clinic, uh -huh. hospital. If we were to, you know, hopefully, if, if we were to go ahead, do you think it would still be okay for us to, to follow some, you Believe know, you it or not, the, working there? the other clinic is already more amenable than the, other, than the last clinic. Okay. Okay. As right. a matter of fact, you know, I, I, I you know, told them I may need more time off, trying to do these things, and they're like, they're all about it. So they would like to see it happen. My the hospital I'm in now, you'd be surprised how often I would have to sit there and, and you know talk an employee into going on camera or doing something, which is why I do most of the camera holding myself. It it gets really really old, you know. I mean, we, I, it would be nice if I had an employee or someone to hold a camera to show how we're doing a case and washing a wound or that type of thing. But the reason, you know, the reason you only get to see that first person stuff is because the hospital I'm in right now is not that friendly about, uh, about this kind of publicity or this kind of education. Okay. Good. Well, that's good. I mean, so just so you know, what we're going to do now is obviously we kind of, uh, I think as I probably said, but we, uh, we'll cut together some of the stuff that we, we got from your YouTube with this and then we'll send it back to the channels that were Will interested. I be able to see any of this stuff? Do you want to see it? Yeah, once we've um, cut this, then I'll send over the link. Okay. Yeah, um, of course, of course. Um, and then we'll send it back to them, and they will... Basically, we uh, when I first contacted you, they had this thing called Real Screen, which you may have heard of, but it's a big pitch, you know. So the channels get lots of pitches, and then they tell you who they want to see more of, or what they want to see more of. And then, so, we then do what we're doing now, and then they get their, all the ideas back in and then they'll just let us know whether they want to move forward with it or not. So obviously we're very help, uh, hopeful and uh, I'll just keep you updated. And, and if we do go further down the line, then we can start talking about um, how that might happen, as in how many episodes it might be and working with you on when is going to be convenient for you to, to be filmed and all that kind of stuff. But, um, okay. but yeah, that, but that's... So if you have any questions or you think, oh, hang on, this might be, you know, I'm changing practice or oh, actually I've got something going on in the summer, which might be really good. It's good to hear from, you know, for us to know. But um, generally, if you've got any questions, just let me know. So I'm getting another at this point in time. Okay, great. And then next time, the techie guy never turned up, so you didn't get to see my uh, 